Uh, yeah, here today I want to talk to you about uh, making Erlang and Elixir systems that are operable. And uh, by operable, I mean systems that people who have to run them in production to keep them up and going find easy and pleasant to work with. Uh, because I think that we all got sold on the idea that Erlang and Elixir could give us nine nines of uptimes and everything would be always super reliable. Um, but tr the, the truth is that if we just throw software on a machine and then don't look at it anymore, it's never going to be reliable. It requires human beings to interact with the system and keep it up and running. But still, uh, with all of that, Erlang and Elixir uh, propose us really, really great tools for that. Uh, when it comes to debugging systems, one of the things that we get told early on is to keep things simple. If we try to be really, really clever to design a solution and there's a bug in the solution, then we need to be even more clever to be able to debug it. So it, it kind of follows that we want things to be as simple as possible. But simplicity is a kind of a weird thing, because you can only have a simple system if nobody uses it and it's not popular. Is if we say that this is, for example, an online store, and we do something like 15 transactions a month of people buying stuff, if this is a fine architecture. Nobody really depends on it. If, however, I tell you that this is a store where you have 15,000 people buying something every month, and there is a team of 30 people who depend on it to uh, gain their salary and have their livelihoods, then this might sound like a very irresponsible architecture because this one machine goes down and 30 people are out of a job, right? So we have to add new capabilities to the system. We might do something like bringing it into multiple regions, adding backups. Uh, if the data doesn't fit a single database, you need multiple copies. When you do reporting about the transactions and all of that stuff, uh, here we could have done maybe a single select query. On that one, we might need a full distributed MapReduce framework to do the thing, right? There is a lot of complexity that is added to the system only because we want it to be up and running. And so the idea that we can keep something simple is kind of a myth. Complexity is inherent to successful systems. If your system can uh, survive without being complex, it is likely not a very good, not a very big system. It can be good anyway. And so uh, the System Bible tells us this. The System Bible is a really, really nice book that I like a lot. This is a third edition. The first editions were called Systemantics. And it gives you a lot of little sarcastic sentences that describe systems. And I'm going to use that in a few places in the presentation to uh, act as a reminder of what has been told. And so one of the things that it tells us is that a simple system may or may not work. There is no guarantee that a system ever works. A, system, uh, a, a simple one may, however, work. A complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved by a small system that worked. What this tells us is that a complex system uh, that you just started, right, out of nowhere, you just decided that I'm going to do this very complex thing. It's going to have 50 different services. I'm going to develop all of it. I'm going to put it into production. It's not going to work. Invariably, what you have to do is to start with a very, very simple system and iterate and add complexity as you go or you already have a complex system and you cannot replace it wholesale. You have to replace components one at a time or drop a lot of features to be able to build from something that is simpler. And the large lesson that it tells, uh, the last lesson it tells us here is that a large system uh, produced by extending the dimensions of a smaller system does not behave like the smaller system. So I gave the example of reporting on sales and on the stuff in the database, but there's something else, right? Behavior is not just what the system does, it's also how it dies and how it fails. The, failures mode of a, uh, the failure modes of a smaller system like that are different from the failure modes of that one. The larger system can survive a single node dying, but the kind of net splits and weird issues that you can have are no longer the same than in the smaller system. And so it follows that the people who operate the system and develop them have to evolve along with it. Uh, but let's say that we have that in place, right? And what we want to do is figure out that uh, there is a bug in the system. The thing that we never want to happen is that a customer finds about it, opens a support ticket, and then you have to explain that, oh yeah, we ship something broken. What you want to do is to be able to detect that there is a problem on your own. And the first tool for that is always monitoring. And monitoring is essentially asking the question, how are you doing to your system? You send a call, a health check, you run a kind of test, and you look at the outputs and you kind of figure out that this is what you expected or not. And this lets you find whether there is a problem, but it doesn't tell you what the problem is. 
If we want to know what the problem is, this is where we enter with the concept of observability. And observability comes from control theory, uh, where the idea is that if you have a simple control system, like a speed regulator on a car or a flight stabilizer in an airplane or on a drone, uh, you can, by only looking at the output, figure out and infer what the internal state of the system is. This is observability. When it comes to software, we cannot really do that, right? Our systems are kind of too complex and too weird. Here, the output might be a page that just says 500. We cannot figure out what the internal state is. So when it comes with server software, what we do is that we add small windows on the side of the black boxes that create new outputs. And these outputs are not meant for the users. They are meant for the developers and the operators, and we try to understand what happens. And so with these tools, we might have our small system, uh, but we want to find whether there is a bug and what it is. And so we have to grow the definition of what the system is. In green, we have components like the metrics, the monitorings, the logs, the alerting system, the backups, uh, the SSH keys in the pipeline, which I assume is to deploy code, because if you cannot deploy code, you don't really have a system. And then by extension, we need to have the yellow components, which have to do with the development, right? If you have code to push, the code has to live somewhere. It is not in an inbox of an email, or hopefully you just don't push it with FTP. You might have a code repository, an issue tracker, continuous integration, uh, a list of developers who are allowed to work on it, and all of that stuff. And that starts to look a bit more at what our system is. And when we make decisions about debugging, we use these components. We tend to interact a lot more with the green and yellow components than the blue components. The blue component you don't touch. You don't want to interact with them too hard. And so we have to grow the vision of a system a bit more. The system includes the people that work in it. So we have developers. We might have operators. We have people that do a bit of both. We have people at the top left corner that don't actually touch anything related to the system itself, but still have an impact. If you have a salesperson that promises a feature that makes no sense, uh, they have an impact in the system despite touching nothing. A CEO that sets the direction of an enterprise does the same thing. And so we have to ask the question, there is an alert. This little dude right here is being paged. How do people make the decision of figuring out what to debug? Because if we want to make the systems operable, we have to understand how the little humans with the pink arrows touch the system in all kinds of ways. And usually, it's all based on the context that we have. And it is all based on the history and the data that goes around it. So if this week you've had five incidents of denial of services because you had too much load of the systems, you will approach the, 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 the incident differently than if you had five incidents that were due to someone pushing broken code every time. right? And so the decisions that we make are not necessarily related to whatever runs in that stuff, but in the overall context and interactions that go on into the organization. And that context is based or located, related to a mental model. This is uh, a map of the city of London. It is not the city of London. It's not super visible, and it's not important. But it is a very detailed map. It has streets, it has rivers, it has train stations, it has building names, it has directions for a bunch of things. Uh, and most people who live in London who, or who have ever visited it do not know all of this by heart. If I wanted to compare it to something in the system, it would be the, the source code, right? And like in code, we might know a specific area very well. Most of it we don't actually know. It's a specification. It's not the entire thing. What runs in a server is not necessarily what you find in the source code. Someone could have patched something. There could be weird libraries, weird environments. It's not the same thing. What we have is, again, some kind of specialization like that. But we work with a map that is much more like this, right? This is a tourist map of London. It tells you where Big Ben is, uh, where the St. Paul's Cathedral is, the Tate Museum. And so if you want to go to different places, you have the very broad roads. You don't see all the details. And this is much closer to what we, what we work with as developers and operators in the system. And I mean, if we look at this diagram, it is much closer to the tourist map than anything else. And if you've been in a kind of architecture meeting, someone might say this is too complex, and you just put a big box in the middle that's written Kafka. And you try to simplify this because this is already too complex. But we work with this. And what's important is that these mental models uh, are always partial. They are never complete. They are always outdated, and we cannot do anything about it because the system and all the information changes too fast and too frequently, and there are too many details. The way we build these models is with repeated interactions with the system. 
It is a bit like uh, when you do science, right? At some point, the science comes from observations and how you predict the behavior of a system. Uh, if you figure out that you lower the temperature low enough, the water freezes, that comes part of your model. You don't have to understand how it works, what goes on at the molecular level, but you have the broad understanding of what goes on into the system. And to drive the point further home that all mental models can be good even if they're bad and incomplete, this is another map of London. Those are the metro stations. Those are the tube stations. They are efficient and effective in an entirely different context. They let you get around very, very far in the city of London, but you don't know where any of the buildings are. And these two maps are extremely useful, but it depends entirely on the context. And so the question comes to be about how people operate the system. It's possible that if you're the person standing next to the metrics and the logs, you have a vision that is extremely analytical about the systems. You care about the data flows. Uh, you care about the numbers, the metrics, the load capacity, and that kind of stuff. And that might be similar to the tube station map. If you're a developer, you are probably thinking about it on a whole entirely different level. Someone ships a feature, and they are a developer that you think sucks, right? They ship code that you think is low quality, you don't trust them, or you trust them very much, or you know that they were on a schedule and they didn't have all the time they required to test things properly. So when there is an incident, you will be aware of some areas, but not all of them, and all of them could be relevant at once. And this is important, and I'm spending a lot of time on that, because we as developers sitting here tend to make tools with the perspective of people touching the code repo a lot. We will put logs in areas that are kind of tricky, where not everything is well documented or well known, uh, whereas the people that operate the system uh, often deal with an entirely different view of things that is not exactly the same. And the thing that we have to be careful about is that we tend to work uh, preparing for the battle of yesterday. The way we choose to add visibility in a system is often based on uh, the logs that we might have, right? Uh, we put logs and metrics in areas where it's kind of tricky. And so we start with a system that seems to work. There is a problem. Something goes wrong. The operators go, you know what? We can't fix this. Send it to the developers. Developers look into it and go, oh, yeah, this is a weird thing in a corner case. We're going to add log. And so what we do is that we put windows into our application that provide visibility in all kinds of areas. So when the bugs go into all these blue places that we see through the windows that we've put in the system, they are easy to fix. But the counterpart of that means that all the tricky bugs, by definition, are going to be in the areas where we have no visibility, like the porch, the entry, or the little bathroom right here. And the reason for that is that if the bug is in an area that we have vis visibility into, it will be easy to fix. So if it is a tricky bug, it usually means that we don't have visibility, and that's it. And the trap that we tend to fall into is to just keep adding and adding and adding visibility as we accrue bugs. And that just creates something I like to call the software engineer's house, which is absolutely terrible, just plenty of windows. There's, by the way, a lot of opportunity to add more visibility on this wall. Um, so this is usually very bad, absolutely terrible to maintain as a developer. You're going to have one function call in one place, and then you're going to have a log line before, a log line after, metrics lines, a probe point for tracing, distributed tracing in there. And for each action that you make, you have to take like seven actions of visibility that make the entire code absolutely impossible to follow. So what we get instead usually is the idea that let's make everything observable, which is kind of the room we're in right now. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, you make a glass house where everything is visible. And this is kind of called the glass pane theory or the glass pane approach to visibility, right? The idea is, is that if having a lot of windows is terrible, let's just make everything absolutely observable. And usually that means that there is a log somewhere for everything that happens in the system. Uh, the most interesting case I've seen of that one is a team where they would uh, put a log statement on every packet received from the network. And so you would process in the network, and there would be the ability to also have all the data that was on the network on a log file on disk. The problem with this approach is that it looks super interesting, but it's a terrible one. Basically, what you're saying is that um, you provide no abstraction whatsoever to operators. The only thing you give, you give them is all of the data, right? It's someone asking you, how does something here work? I have a question about it. And you give them the map of the city of London with all the streets. Like, 
deal with it. This is a lack of abstraction. It's basically saying that if you want to operate the software, you have to be able to understand how it works internally. It helps nobody. Uh, and, and on the opposite, uh, since this model only works for people who already understand the system, you'll find out that people who already understand the system don't use this. And the example for that is, once again, uh, if you log every bit of data that comes over the network, any operator who knows how to deal with a network won't go in your software to turn, to turn on the logging switch. They're going to go use TCP dump or Wireshark and get the data directly. And so what happens when we build systems like this is that we make everything visible. People who don't understand the system have no way of operating it, and people who know how to operate the system don't care about it. It's a loss of time. It's not a good thing. Instead, what we should look into uh, is the layers of abstractions in which we operate. The operators are never in contact with the system. It's only a partial view at any point in time. When we try to build a glass house or put the logs, we usually do it all at the application layer. And when we put it that way, that shows a bit how ridiculous it can be. If I try through my application logs to make everything visible for the framework, the library, the standard library, the language, the operating system, the hardware, and the drivers, it's a, lose, it's a lost cause. You won't be able to provide visibility into all of that. If, however, we look into how people debug their systems and how operators do it, um, if you are interacting with the operating systems, you're going to be using the operating systems debugging facilities. And what these will tell you is what you are doing with the operating system, how that goes, right? So if I'm, what I want to check is my interactions with the operating system. Do they make sense? If I'm using the debugging facilities at the application layer, what I should be trying to get is the information about how am I interacting with the application. Do I have weird configurations in there that I should not be doing, right? Am I poking at the application the wrong way? If I am looking to debug the application itself because I developed the application, I should not be trusting the application's logs because there's a bug already. They are not trustworthy. If I'm debugging the application, I want to get the information from layers below. That means the framework, the libraries, or the language, or the operating system. And we're lucky because in Erlang and Elixir, we do get a very observable stack in the middle right there. If you're using a language like Go, because I partly have problems with Go, this doesn't really exist in terms of debuggability. You put what you want in the application or you use the operating system, but there is very little in the middle. And so we should learn to leverage that stuff. Right? So when we create logs at the application layers, they should be for users of the applications wanting to understand their interactions with the application. When we want to debug the systems, we have to really put the probes ourselves a layer below for ourselves and create these kinds of scopes and, score and stories and layers of abstractions. Uh, when we deal with uh, user experience, there's, there's always this idea about making sure of who is the user, what does the user know, what do they want to do with the application. We should do the same with operators and do operator experience and go, what does the operator have as a basic knowledge? Are they level one support, level two support? Are they developers debugging something and create different tools and different points of views, uh, different point of views for different levels of operators and really structure the system for them in such a way? And so what the system Bible tells us is that the crucial variables are discovered by accident. Uh, this is basically saying that uh, in a kind of philosophical way, something does not exist until it breaks down, right? Uh, if, again, I, I take an example from physics, you have the Newtonian physics, you have an idea about gravity, you have an idea about how water freezes and all these physical phenomena. Uh, but if you go at a low level enough, you start looking at quantum physics and the rules are not the same anymore. Right? When we build a model, the model works until it doesn't. And it when it's, it's when it stops working that we figure out that, oh crap, something was extremely important. Right? Uh, you don't really care about the temperature at which your car runs until it overheats or freezes in the winter, which is not really a problem here, I realize, but it's a very real one for me. <laughs> But, but you discover them when you don't know, and when they are there and they work fine, they're just part of the background, and whatever is in the background does not exist. When everything else correlates with everything else, things will never settle down. This tends to be, in the context of the book, something that means that if you take a corrective action somewhere in the system, and then everything change and changes and changes, and you don't know if what you did had any effect, 
you will be able to do nothing else. But I like it also in the vision of metrics and logs and visibility into the system. I don't know if you've ever seen a dashboard of someone who has had multiple incidents, but you can have something like 500 different metrics about things that might be happening. Are the response times normal in every one of the services and all of these things? And when you get these very complex dashboards, um, you end up going with the idea that you don't know what stands for what, what causes what, what is the consequence of something. And at that point, you're just looking at numbers and trying to gain insights from nothing, right? You're not able to do anything. Uh, if we want to be able to provide a bit more of a, I'll say, I don't want to say a tunnel vision, but a narrowed down vision of what happens in the systems that can orient things a bit better. A system is no better than its sensory organs. And in the system, we do have humans are part of the system again. So if you don't have any kind of good ways to get the observability without building a glass house, the system is not going to have a good uh, quality to it. And I like the last one. The, be the meaning of a communication is the behavior that results. If what you're communicating is important in people or systems or pieces of code or services change what they are doing, it is meaningful communications. If what you have is this huge um, glass house where 99% of, of the information that you output and the messages that you send are used by no one and have no consequences, they are essentially useless. So the meaning of a communication is the behavior that results. So that's starting to be a bit complex in terms of how you make something operable. And one of the questions that we get to ask is, couldn't we just automate that? Can I make a kind of uh, a, a little something that takes a tricky operation and just removes it, right? We don't need operators if the system operates itself. And so one example for that would be a database. I have a master database. I have followers. And when the master goes down, I, as an operator, come in there. I'm the agent. I remove the old database, I switch the configuration, and everything is right. That could take, I don't know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, five minutes to page someone. The person looks at the database, checks out that it's actually dead, does the change in configuration, confirms that everything is normal. And so if that happens frequently, we get the reaction that we might want to automate that bit and just say, like, what if a piece of code replaced a person in here? And here's part of the problem. It is something called the law of requisite variety. And the law of requisite variety essentially tells you that if you want to control a component, you can only do that if you are able to represent all the complexity of the component within yourself to be able to understand all the actions it can take and to make the actions yourselves, right? And if you don't have that, this is a hard limit in what you can control in the system. It represents either a point to which you can no longer control things or where you will introduce worse bugs than you would have had otherwise. So if we look at the database and I decided to replace myself with an agent, it's possible that in the initial cycle I get an alarm when the master is down. But when I confirm that the master is down for real or not, I look at what the clients are doing. I look at board reports. I try to look into the actual product if it works. If the agent only looks at the health check and it turns out that the agent is in the same cloud as the rest of the system, this might just be a net split. Maybe the master is not down. And so if the agent is tricked by the net split in doing something, I'm now actively corrupting data. And this is where the love requisite variety is interesting, because this is my understanding of the database. It's up or down. It's master or it's follower. And I encode that into an agent. And the agent tells me that the system is up or down and who's the master, right? I simplify things a whole lot if I'm able to map all the states of the component myself. But if I get this wrong and the problem is not up, down, it's up, down, and maybe, then all of a sudden I created a bug. And to debug the system, I have to understand the up, down, maybe, and all the states. And I have to understand that the agent has this wrong vis vision. And I have to understand how they all interact with each other to create a bug. And then I can fix it. So automation that does not properly take care of the law of requisite variety is almost guaranteed to eventually cause really, really large outages that will be very tricky to debug. So one question you can ask about that is, uh, if you want to automate something, you want them to be a good teammate to the operators on your teams. And what a good teammate does is understand the objectives of the team, of the enterprise, of the people in there. A good teammate is able to communicate their progress or lack of progress. They are able to realize when they hit their own limits, tell them to other people, or even know when someone else is doing something in the system and hold back to avoid interactions. 
Who here has written a bot that respects that and is a good teammate? I didn't, right? Nobody has done it. So the kind of question you have to ask yourself is, is it going to be easier to make all our automated agents much smarter such they are good teammates or much stupider so that they don't need to be good teammates? Um, and so the system Bible tells us if you put an extra brain in the tail, the tail will wag on its own schedule. If you automate something, you lose part of the control you had itself. Uh, the system itself does not do what it says it is doing. You have to introspect it, but it's never totally accurate. Control is exercised by the element with the greatest variety of behavioral responses. That's a lot of requisite variety. And in a system, we have to recognize that this is always a human being. We are the ones who write the code. We are the ones to understand it. We are the ones to debug it. Uh, the moment that there is an AI that is smarter than us, that's the person who now rules the system, right? So we have to have the greatest variety of behavioral response. And then that's also my other favorite one from the book. If it's worth doing at all, it's worth doing poorly. And the way I interpret that one is that if you want to do something like automate an agent, ask yourself the question, if I do a crappy job and I ship buggy code, is it still going to be a good thing? And sometimes the answer is going to be yes, right? This is a bug that happens every, it happens three times a week. And if it works like nine times out of 10, it's going to be a huge improvement, then do it. But if what you have is no, we have to make it perfect. And if there's one case where it's wrong, we are totally screwed, then don't automate it. Instead, what you want to do is probably just take out all the tricky bits, which are likely to be decision making, and leave them to human beings. And then what you're going to automate are actions, the boring stuff, entering numbers in a terminal and making sure that you don't typo anything. That's what you want to automate. You automate actions, not decisions. That's a little rule of thumb that makes it a lot easier to know what to do. Uh, but we can now get back into Erlang and Elixir, what we can do as developers, what is available to us as tools. And if we start at the top of the layers of abstractions, we have logging. Right? There's also metrics, but metrics, I assume that you can go look into uh, you know, statistics 101 classes telling you about medians, averages, percentiles. As far as I know, there is no uh, logging 101 university class anywhere that you can use for that instead. Uh, so I'm going to focus on logging. The most important thing is stating facts. In your logs, you want to be factual. You don't want to be providing interpretation to people. Right? If I'm in a piece of code like this, I don't have context into any other component on the system. All I know is the local state that I have, and I want to expose that. So I want to be stating facts. If I am uploading an image to an image upload service, and then uh, the operation fails, I should not be putting in the log, um, upload failed, server is down, right? The server is not necessarily down. We don't know that for sure. What we know, for example, is that we try to upload the image, but we got an error trying to connect with a given POSIX code or some kind of error. That's what we want to put in there. If we provide only interpretations, we have two things that are going to happen. The operator that looks at the interpretation trusts the log message and goes investigate the upload image service to ask why it's down. When they figure out that it's not necessarily down, what happens then is the second consequence. Now they have lost a lot of time, but what happens next is that they update their mental model of the system. And their mental model of the system tells them the logs are not something I can trust. And so what you are teaching your people when you provide wrong interpretations is you are teaching them to ignore you and ignore the system and stop trusting it. Right? So it is better to have a detailed but hard to understand uh, error message or log message than to have a friendly one that is meaningless. The worst example I've seen out of that uh, was an old piece of software that used to communicate with an old piece of server. And they were doing that over HTTPS with TLS and SSL and encryption. And they kind of assume when they wrote the software that both would remain up to date all the time. And so if the connection would break, it would be for a very specific reason that was not related to configuration. But the problem is that the server kept being updated and the software stopped being updated. And at some point, the SSL connections could no longer be established. And what the software said as an error message is, error, you are being hacked. Which frankly is meaningless, right? Even if you are not a technical person, what can you do if you are being hacked? It is an entirely useless message that misguides the user more than anything. 
Um, the other thing that we want to do at that point is going to be used, using structured logging. And structured logging, uh, to make it really, really simple, is that you log a map of data. Um, or at least something that is vaguely key in value. And structured logging is interesting because it makes it very easy to avoid interpretations, uh, but it also lets you put all kinds of information, like what was happening, what, what went on, what are the details, uh, what's the context around these things. And once you have these keys and values, it becomes really easy to develop tools that consume these logs. Uh, and if you have the tools that consume the log, you are able to, at some point, provide interpretations somewhere else than where you generate the logs that have the information required to do it. Uh, the other thing that's interesting with structured logging like that is that you make it easy to filter and again redirect the logs in different places. Logs have different consumers the same way we have different operators. If the log is meant for a developer in a staging environment, you want all the logs you can and you don't care if they're there for a long time. You assume the developer is looking at it and maybe one hour of retention is enough. If the log is regarding user actions uh, that might be useful for your support team, you might want to have them three weeks, right? It's possible that the user notices a problem after three days, opens a ticket. The ticket takes two days to be open. We're at five days right now. Then you roll over to the weekend. You're at seven days. Uh, it goes to the first level of support, not able to do anything about it, escalates it to second level of support. You're now on Wednesday the week after. It goes to a developer. The developer looks at it, takes two or three days to fix it, and then you need it almost two weeks and a half to be able to have access to the logs. So if you don't store the logs for at least two weeks and a half, you are not fixing anything for anyone and the logs are meaningless. So uh, the retention is important there. If what you are doing is an audit log that goes for financial transactions and it might be something that has to do with law enforcement or government regulations, you might want to store it for six months or seven years, who knows? And ideally, what you have is only a single log statement in your code. You don't want to have a log statement for the debug, a log statement for the user, a log statement for support, a log statement for the auditor. Right? If you use structured logging, you are able to use the keys that you want in each type of report you have, but you only have one log statement per piece of code that you need. So that leaves your, your code mu much clearer, and it lets you dynamically or eventually change how you report it, depending on who you want to report it to. Uh, and, and so that's what I think. If you have that, you have very good logging. That's better than 95% of the logging you'll see anywhere else. So that's what we provide at the application layer. Let's get a level below. We have what OTP provides. That's the framework level. Uh, you probably have debugging facilities in Phoenix as well, but I'm not super experienced with Phoenix, so I'm going straight down to OTP. And OTP has something called a sys module, a system module. And what that lets you do is that when you turn it on, you get all the messages that go to an OTP process. So that includes supervisors, gen servers, gen statem, gen event, uh, and uh, to some extent, uh, gen stage. Gen stage has a little caveat that I'm going to mention in a short time. But you just turn it on with true or false to turn it off, and it starts outputting the logs. And so you do something like that. Trace it to true, I slipped for uh, one millisecond because it was a very active system. And you can see that the client got each message, changed its states, and does all the returns like that, and you're able to get that. What's interesting is that this trace call is something that you can set directly in the start link arguments of any OTP process. So if you are running a test somewhere, and uh, you want to know what's going on, I want no one to ever do print statement debugging anymore turn on the tracing and see what's going on instead. Uh, a different one is log. Log is essentially the same as trace, but instead of outputting all the logs directly to the shell, um, it keeps them in a ring buffer in memory. And so when you call get with the function, you get the last events that you had in there. So syslog blah, 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 set it to true, store five log events, let it run, get five of them, and you get the list. And uh, you can do that super fine. Uh, you had a caveat with that with GenStage because GenStage uses GenServer as its underlying implementation. So when you use these functions in GenStage, you are going to get the internal details of GenStage. It kind of breaks the abstraction because it's the tool built on top of the framework. Uh, but in general, you can use that for almost anything. If that's not enough, there's an install function. An install uses the same events that you see there in message, change, and whatever, and you can run an arbitrary callback on them. And so what you can do is filter to only output the events that you think are relevant, or you can do something like, uh, 
send messages and forward, forward them. So one thing that I've seen done and that, that is kind of interesting is that if you have a state machine that changes multiple states and you want to test it, you can just install a function that forwards a message about the changings of states to your process and all you see all the time is just going to be, well, the state machines went from state A, B, and C and you're able to track it. There's no dependency injection, don't, no need to mock anything. The debugging facilities are built into the framework. And then you get the even fancier stuff that's kind of scary. Get status lets you know a bunch of details. Get states get, lets you see the internal state, right? The thing that you set after every reply or no reply call, that kinds of stuff. And replace state lets you change the state of the server on the fly in production without interruption. I've not done it a lot of time, but it's kind of really, really weird and scary when you do it. But it's nice to know that it's there. Then we drop at the language level. Uh, frankly, there's a lot of it. Uh, so I'm inviting you to go look at uh, Erlang and Anger. It's online for free. It's about 90 pages. And you'll see about uh, finding about memory bottlenecks, being able to debug uh, what takes too much CPU. If you have memory fragmentation, how to fix this and all of that. Uh, this is probably more of a lesson. It's not for the operator. It's when the operator tells us, OK, the problem is definitely with the Beam VM and your code. You figure it out. So that's for you at that point. Um, something else that's interesting uh, and not in the book, it's microstate accounting. If you want to know rapidly where the CPU is being spent, uh, you need to compile the virtual machine to have microstate accounting. And when you do that, you run it for a period of time, it's going to tell you like 50% of the time is being spent in garbage collection, 20% of the time is being spent in sleeping, 10% of the time is being sent interacting with the network. And you're able to very quickly know where the problem might be if it's anything related to performance. The other thing that you need to be familiar with is tracing. And so there is Rexbug, which I think is the friendliest one for Elixir. It's a wrapper around Redbug. And you put in a string with uh, the function calls and the arguments you want as if it were pattern matching. It's going to dynamically match all the patterns that you have and output the functions and the process that call them to give whatever call you had that matched that one. And this is extremely powerful. I think there are almost no other programming languages out there that have that. Um, and that can replace a debugger. The weakness of a debugger when you break a breakpoint is that it stalls a single process and then the rest of them just explodes because of timeouts. If you do that, you can just see a trace and that replaces logging everything, right? You can willingly, whenever you choose, add logs for what you want on demand with tracing. And so Rexbug, I think, is the safest one that you can use in Elixir right now uh, with the friendly level. Uh, you don't want to use DBG or the trace bits themselves. The reason being that they have no safeguards and it's really, really easy to accidentally start tracing uh, the process that outputs the traces. And then it takes roughly a tenth of a second for the node to die of missing memory. So you want to use Rexbug. I'm also partial to Recon uh, because I wrote it and so I made it the way I like. Uh, <laughs> the problem with it, I think, for the Elixir folks here is uh, this fun to ms call that I do implicitly. And I don't think that Elixir has an exact match on fun to ms If there is one, it would be nice to have a wrapper. The difference between a Recon and Redbug is that you don't use strings to carry stuff around. Uh, but you also have a more, uh, an easier time to specify that you want to see the return values. You have the ability to trace to a file or to trace to a process on a different node. So it's a bit more flexible. And then we drop below the virtual machine. If you're using Linux, there's something called perf. Perf is a set of probes that the operating system gives us. And these probes let you know essentially what calls in C are being made. Process main is essentially just Erlang code that is running. And this is an investigation uh, that I led at some point because we thought that accepting SSL connection was taking too long. And we thought that the problem would be that the crypto functions were being uh, too busy, right? All the cryptographic work was very he heavy. But what we found is that lib crypto that is being used there is never above 6% CPU. And so that wasn't the problem. When we looked at it, we saw all these kinds of functions, copy shallow, db minor, db next hash, db get hash, db select delete hash. And I didn't really know what they were, so I just took grep and I grepped it in the OTP source code. And I found out that at least all these were related to et select delete. And so I used recon, I got on the node and I decided trace me all the processes that use at select delete. And when I got a bunch of output there that matched with a bunch of CPU there, I knew that this was the process eating all of the CPU doing ETS operations. And it turned out to be the SSL manager process in the library uh, that ships with OTP. 
it had a cache table that was not that was not efficient. And so all we did is we wrote a quick patch to bypass the cache, and all of a sudden the SSL library became five times faster to accept any kind of SSL connections. In fact, we were uh, competitive in terms of performance with the C++ libraries that Amazon had just by investigating that, and that took maybe half a day. But if you want to do that with only the logs that you put at the application layer, good luck. Below that, you have DTrace and System Tap. DTrace was uh, started on uh, FreeB uh, not on FreeBSD, on Solaris, and is used on all the BSDs. So FreeBSD, OpenBSD, um, OSX has it as well. And it's a very, very effective way to write all kinds of probes and traces in the operating system. They let you get metrics and log events and all that kind of stuff. System tap is basically Linux saying, oh, that's neat. We want that as well. It's not as friendly, it's not as fast, but it's still pretty good. And what you can do with these is that they all come with a little embedded programming language. In DTrace, it's called D. And um, you write the little scripts, or you can make one-liners. It reports all the information. What's interesting is that the Erlang virtual machine has been instrumented so that all the operations it runs are also visible to DTrace and system tap. And so that includes when a process is scheduled, when a function is being called, when a message is being sent. We're all able to do that with operating system level tools. And then there's a thing called the DIN trace module. If you compile the virtual machine with support for these probes, the dynamic tracing module exports what is essentially one ugly function that takes like eight arbitrary arguments. But these eight arbitrary arguments let you set your own DTrace and system tap probes in your Erlang or Elixir code to make them visible to uh, operating system tools. And so this is a little script for a uh, system tap that looks for fully qualified function calls. So when the gen UDP uh, function is called, it starts, a, it's, it starts a timer, which it interrupts and takes the difference when INET UDP send is used. And so essentially what this does is calculate how much time is spent uh, in the virtual machine between when you call gen UDP to send the packet and when it leaves the virtual machine for the driver. And this would be kind of tricky to do with any kind of profiling tool otherwise. But then you run it with just that, right? You run the thing, here's the script, here's the PID, it tells you how many microseconds are spent. Here's a small dtrace in line script uh, that I wrote because I was trying to debug why some software was really, really slow on a Raspberry Pi. And I suspected that it was related to system calls. So this little thing that goes when, whenever Beam SMP is running, take all the system calls and tells me how long it takes to run. And it turns out that all the system calls were related to file access. And so when you, call, you write a second script to, to, to just go like, give me the name of, of the files that are being open, I noticed that all the files that were being opened were Erlang modules that were being loaded in the VM. And so the problem, which took about half an hour to diagnose, is that I had a terrible SD card that was too slow. Debugging that from the application would be extremely difficult. Um, Another thing that is interesting uh, that I found when I uh, worked a lot with property-based testing is that when you write stateful properties, one of the things that you are asked to do is create a kind of model of what the system should be doing. So if I have a little web service, it might be that whenever I log in and I write information, I'm able to read the information back. This is a simple model of what the system should be doing. And so um, when you call that and it runs it against the real system, it tells you if it respects it or not. This is not super important. The word that is important here is model. Because the thing that's interesting is that in some cases it's really easy to come up with a good model. And in some cases it is extremely hard to find any kind of model that makes sense. If you use something like um, a, a circuit breaker or a thing with a timer or something that is non-deterministic, you might find it extremely difficult to write any kind of model. And so I found out that it's kind of related to code coverage, right? High code coverage is not a guarantee that you have good tests. But low code coverage is a pretty good guarantee that your tests are bad. And so it's kind of the same thing, right? If you have a model that is easy to write, it's not a sign that it's going to be easy to operate your software. But if you're not able to come up as a, with a model as the person writing the code, there is a very good chance that none of your operators are going able to do it either. So uh, the last tip I would give is that practice makes perfect. There's a lot of tools, right? A lot of them. And the problem is kind of figuring out where do I start? How do I get good with them? And so the first thing I will tell you is that whenever you're working on a test and the test fails and you're not exactly sure why, 
I don't want you to use print statement debugging. Print statement debugging belongs in 1976, all right? So what you want to do is be able to use the tools that work in production and use them in development. If in production you are allowed to use Observer, use Observer to debug your tests. If in production you're allowed to trace, use the trace to debug your test. If in production you're allowed to use a system module, use it. Right? And so you will get to put yourself in the shoes of a system operators and, and, and understand how that works. And to make it a bit easier, at least, both Elixir and Erlang have breakpoints, right? If you run your tests with IES, uh, IEX SMIX test, they will run a few called pry in there. It's going to stall the test, and then you drop in a shell, and you're able to debug what is going on. So what I would tell you is that when that happens, drop in the top of the test that fails, set up all your probes, all your tracing, all your tools, put it in place, then let the test fail and try to figure out what happened. Because this is what you're going to do in production in the best of cases. And as you get good doing that, you will do two things. The first of, one, the first of them is learn all the tools that can be useful. The second one is figure out where your code is really, really hard to debug. Right? If none of the processes have a name and they are really, really short-lived, you might have a harder time. It will help you identify the places in your code where operations are extremely tedious and tricky and maybe help you change them and figure out how it goes. And if you find a place where print statement debugging is the only tool you have, Ask yourself, is there a layer below the one I'm working at right now where I can add probes that let me debug the system? And that's how we made systems a lot more operable. And that's what I had to talk to you about today. Any questions?